Every time someone in my family died, we went to Nordstrom. When we were kids, my brothers and I knew of no other place to get clothing. Every major life event called for a trip to the third floor of the big brown building at the mall. First Communion, Nordstrom. Growth spurt, Nordstrom. And funerals, we definitely went to Nordstrom for those. My parents bought me a dark blue blazer with brass buttons for my granddad's memorial. It was important that I grieve the dead looking like a prepubescent sea captain. My parents wanted me and my brothers to look nice, and they had the resources to do it. They liked showing us off to the congregation every Sunday. Maybe they thought it would make it easier for God to locate us if we all looked like we had a 10 a.m. tea time. There they are, the Almighty would say from some celestial viewpoint. There stand the Hanafi brothers. They're the ones in matching khakis and Ralph Lauren button-downs. Everyone knows God only has eyes for those who shop Nordstrom's half-yearly sale. My mom's favorite time to shop was back to school season. She flipped through the hangers with speed and precision, selecting the best graphic tees and cargo shorts, deciding for herself what I would wear while giving me the illusion of choice in the matter. For years, she convinced me that clothing should be roomy. Even though I was short and skinny, I wore nothing but large t-shirts. If a stiff breeze had caught me at just the right angle, I could have taken flight. Despite my mother doing most of my shopping for me, I had some preferences. I avoided certain colors, believing I couldn't pull them off. I just wanted to blend in, and daring to wear a yellow shirt to school would have drawn more scrutiny than I was already getting for choosing to wear skate shoes. The shoes slapped me with the label of poser, a universal term for just about any Southern California kid in search of an identity. If you wore skate shoes and did not skate, you were a poser. If you dressed like a goth and didn't like nine inch nails, you were a poser. If you wore a trench coat and never shot anyone, you were a poser. <laughs> my mom was dismissive of anyone who called out my footwear. It's okay if you don't like skateboarding, she'd say. If you like them, you should wear them. It was a maternal way of saying what I imagined she really wanted to say. Fuck those kids. I did like the shoes, and I wore them just like everybody else did. I wasn't the only skate shoe wearing poser in that school. I found it hypocritical that no one applied the same standard to tennis shoes. No one ever called out anyone wearing tennis shoes for not decorating their walls with Andre Agassi posters. I gave no thought to going everywhere from school to church to funerals, dressed in my baggy clothes, my Tommy Hilfiger polos and Quicksilver tees, my striped country club sweaters, my cargo shorts with enough spare storage to go fly fishing. That's how it went for years. My dad tied my necktie for senior prom. My mom ironed my high school graduation gown and then off to college, I went. I think my confused fashion sense is why I didn't get laid in college until my senior year. <laughs> Bless that woman. <laughs> she. She must have looked past the voluminous curtains of my appearance to see the man underneath. <laughs> Years later, I dated a woman who taught me how to dress. She texted me and told me to pick a day to go shopping. It was difficult to make room in my busy schedule of playing Diablo 3 and masturbating, <laughs> but somehow I found the time. We headed into the mall, and my first clue that this was going to be a shopping trip like nothing I'd experienced before was when we walked straight past the Nordstrom. <laughs> but that was Nordstrom. That, that's where they keep all the nice clothes. Into Express, we walked. This couldn't be real. The only stores I was aware of that weren't Nordstrom were Sharper Image and Sam Goody. But in this store, I saw no Vortex fans or Blink-182 albums. What I did see were mannequins wearing slim-fit dress shirts, chino-style pants, and shorts that ended above the knees. <laughs> After selecting a number of items from the racks, she directed me to the dressing room and followed me inside. It was the most subversive thing I'd ever seen anyone do. <laughs> I removed whatever large shirt I was wearing that day and stood there, bare-chested, while she thumbed through the hangers for the shirt she wanted me to try on. I noticed they all said, medium. 
I slipped it over my head and immediately felt like I was choking. It was too small. Send it back. I only, I only wear larges. But when I looked in the mirror, I saw something astonishing. Even though I hardly ever exercised, I saw muscles. There they were, two defined pectorals headlining my torso, flanked on both sides by biceps peeking out of dangerously short sleeves. She gave my newly exposed arm a little squeeze. She was having fun playing dress up with her fixer-upper boyfriend. <laughs> it occurs to me now that I was likely not her first project, nor was I her last. <laughs> but at the time, I knew I would follow her wherever this journey took me. <laughs> Men are pliable when they're getting laid. <laughs> the next stop was the jeans section, and I was always particular about jeans. I knew my waistline and length as well as my own social security number. But she showed me it wasn't the size I was doing wrong, it was the style. I had been wearing jeans more suited for demolition jobs and construction sites. Aww. <laughs> Oh. In those post-college days, I was making strategic incursions into millennial territory like Normal Heights and North Park and occasionally Hillcrest and saw men walking around in jeans, flush with the thigh and tight at the ankle, below which emerged colored socks. Colored socks <laughs> above leather or suede shoes. Like the yellow shirts I so feared in high school, there was no way I could pull off something that fearless. Skinny jeans were a no but she knew that. So standing there in my boxers, I waited as she went back to the store and selected a pair of slim fit jeans. As I put them on, I fought the urge to panic. It was gonna be okay, I thought. My sperm count would be whatever it was supposed to be. <laughs> I looked in the mirror. The image of myself was somehow what it was supposed to be this entire time. But it wasn't until after a few awkward weeks of walking around in the slimmest jeans I'd ever worn that I started to feel normal. One time I got a stain on the new jeans and had to put on a pair of my old ones. That felt weird. Once her grand work was completed, my fashionista girlfriend dumped me. <laughs> Another boy fixed, she might have said to herself, <laughs> as she reclined at home, smiling between sips of Pinot Noir. <laughs> she didn't turn me into a fashion icon. All she did was break a few of my bad habits, and for that I'm grateful. Because if I kept dressing like a teenager during my dating years when presentation truly mattered, I may have never met my wife. In my first year on the online dating market, I put real effort into how I dressed. I ironed shirts and polished shoes before every date. Sometimes I even went shopping for new clothes. But that quickly became unsustainable in the age of Tinder. When I was one fish in an entire ocean of 20-somethings in search of love, all of us averaging at least two dates per week. No one who lived in an apartment with coin-operated washers and dryers could afford to do that much fucking laundry. <laughs> Eventually, I embraced the being-yourself method of dating and started going to the bars wearing whatever was available. They say clothes make the man, but I became less convinced that clothes would make me someone's boyfriend. I admit, on my first date with my wife, I wore a shirt that probably could have used a wash. 30 minutes before meeting the woman I would eventually marry, I selected a shirt from my closet, gave it a whiff, nodded once, and wore it out the door. <laughs> Guilty. She wore a dark navy flowing V-neck thing. It was a garment I stopped trying to correctly identify the second I saw her. She was stunning. I suddenly became aware of my shirt. I should have washed the damn thing. If she noticed, she didn't seem to mind, or if she noticed, she never told me. All I know is now, six years later, my wife is the last critic of my fashion, and that is just fine by me. My wife is a good dresser. She knows what works on her body and what does not, and she takes advantage, advantage of generous return policies to try new things. With each experiment, she hones her personal style. She's confident in her own skin and knows when she looks especially good. It occurs to me that since I'm married to her now, I could decide at any time to go back to the way I dressed when I was 17. <laughs> I could return to cargo shorts and blousy button downs. I could swim in oversized t-shirts like a malnourished manatee. 
she might grouse a little, perhaps make a strategic comment here or there, but she it's not like she'd leave me, right? <laughs> she likes to point out that my closet consists of little more than black t-shirts I bought at rock band merch tables and blue plaid button downs from 2011 that should have made the journey to the great thrift store beyond years ago. What can I say? I'm still afraid of yellow shirts. Maybe this is what marriage is. Simply accepting when your wife is feeling ambitious on a Saturday morning and chooses to deep clean the apartment without your help because you just get in the way. And you're so immersed in video games that you don't notice when she raids your closet and mercy kills half your clothes. <laughs> she does this out of love. A tough kind of love. A love that says, I care how you look, but more importantly, I care how you look when I'm standing next to you. The first time we went to the mall together, I drove her crazy with how decisive and indecisive I was at the same time. I didn't know what I wanted to wear, but I definitely knew what I would never wear. She'd vanished for several minutes into the store, then returned with an armful of patterned shirts that I dismissed one at a time until she pursed her lips and glared at me. Nowadays, she just buys shirts and makes me try them on. I'll never like it the first time. It's too trendy, I say. It, it's too showy. But then a day later, I wear it, and it's my favorite shirt ever. <laughs> I wore one of those shirts on the day I bought a suit for our wedding. She asked me if I wanted her to come with me to help me decide on a color, but I said no. I thought it would be healthy for me to do this on my own. The tailor gave me a firm handshake and welcomed me to the back room, where he presented a well-used book of fabrics and illustrations, buttons, and possibilities. He wanted to know what I wanted. What would mean the most to me on the most important day of my life? He asked me questions about pocket squares and cufflinks and what my groomsmen would wear, leaving no detail unconsidered and no preference unaddressed. And a few months later, I straightened my tie in a hotel mirror two hours before saying my vows. I wore a perfectly tailored suit with my full name embroidered above the left interior pocket. I had chosen every aspect of it down to the very last stitch. It was the finest garment I'd ever worn, and I can say as a matter of hard, undeniable, unbiased fact, I looked good. <laughs> then I watched my wife walk down the aisle toward me, and I realized I didn't look nearly as good as her. <laughs> she was an empress in white and pearl and glinting sequins, little crystalline bursts that slowed time as she moved. I'd never seen her eyes so blue. I had never seen her smile so wide. She took my hands and looked me up and down in my suit. She liked what she saw. Of course she did. She had picked out my shoes. <laughs> Brent Hannafee, ladies and gentlemen. Brent Hannafee.